Okay, so um, uh, for this afternoon's session, I will be talking about a number of um, uh, more advanced uh, topics in sampling. What I was actually thinking about was um, that I would do the first uh, two of them, the important sampling and the sequential Monte Carlo, and then maybe stop there in order to um, spend more time on, on the practical exercises. Um, like for two reasons, one, because some people were having a lot of problems like with the actual installation of R and Inla. So for those people who are only just getting them to work, it's kind of like you would like to actually try that first exercise if you haven't finished it. Uh, whereas people who have already done that can go on uh, quite happily to, to the second exercise. And you know, uh, I think that's worthwhile. If then at the very end of the day, maybe um, with like 20 minutes to go, I, I could just say something about approximate Bayesian computation and pseudo-marginal MCMC, I think that would probably uh, do a good, good job on covering those topics. So um, uh, what time do we finish? It's 5, 5.30. OK, so we have one hour and a half. Finish before it's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, all right, so this first topic is important sampling. Um, in the previous section, we saw how the Laplace approximation can be used to estimate posterior functionals, or posterior moments, or posterior density ratios. Um, we, we recognize that it was a first order approximation. It was uh, an approximation that was somewhat crude. We, we are you know, placing this uh, sort of Gaussian ansatz function on top and, and integrating over that instead of our real function. So, um, you know, we we knew it would converge somewhat with uh, increasing amounts of data, but um, there was like nothing much we could do without going to get more data in order to improve our approximation. Uh, it was more or less the story. So um, an alternative method, uh, if we want to, with a, for a given amount of data, get a better approximation of what the posterior uh, moments, or say posterior means, posterior variances, and things look like, uh, is to use this technique called importance sampling. So uh, importance sampling is interesting in that it can give us an unbiased estimate of something like, like the mean, the posterior mean, or, or I should really say an unbiased estimate of the mean if we have a fully normalized distribution. Uh, and unbiased means that if we, um, uh, would rep if we do importance sampling if to a certain amount of, uh, of computational time or a number of draws, and we would repeat that process over and over, we can keep improving our estimate of whatever we're trying to find, like the mean, um, and just by running it longer. So it's the unbiased uh, uh, sense is, is much like having no systematic errors, that we are actually able to help ourselves out uh, to estimating it better. The, um, there is a catch, which I'll mention in a bit, for posteriors because of their lack of normalization. But the notation that we'll use for this Maybe it looks a little bit funny, uh, you'll, but I think it's worthwhile to see this so that you can recognize it in other places. Uh, we often write this um, for our, uh, if we want to have a, I guess it looks a little bit like um, statistical mechanics notation some, somehow, but the, the expression would be like this. If we want to estimate the um, uh, sort of the expectation or the posterior mean of some function h, um, or again, with respect to some distribution capital pi, we, we do that by integrating the function over the probability density of, of, that, of the unknown variable x on which the function h operates. So um, remember, x can just, is just sort of a, a placeholder for some, uh, some unknown or unspecified probability density. Um, and in this case, we, uh, you know, to make it more concrete, we could say, imagine that pi is a normal distribution um, well, this might be a bit of a silly example, and we and we didn't know, uh, or just we pretend we don't know uh, what the mean of that is, but we would want to estimate it. Then you would make the integral of simply x times the normal density. Um, less trivial would be if uh, pi was uh, some kind of gamma uh, gamma distribution or gamma density, uh, and you weren't looking on Wikipedia to see what the formula for the mean was. Then you could find it out by integrating x against the density. Um, you can do that integration numerically if you would just apply a quadrature. Of course, as the dimension goes up, um, uh, Corin uh, 
emphasized uh, the cost of something like quadrature, or you can call it cubature in high dimensions, uh, quickly becomes prohibitive. It has a terrible scaling. So we would like to try a different method. Um, the way that we achieve this, or to find the important sampling, or to motivate important sampling, I should say, is to imagine simply rewriting this integral uh, by adding um, an extra function or extra, um, it's going to be an extra density here, uh, which we can call g. And so we just multiply it, you know, to the uh, numerator and also multiply it against the denominator. So we've not actually done anything to our integral. It's quite straightforward. Um, but what we can then do is if we've written the integral like this, we, we, have, we can find an algorithm for estimating then uh, the posterior functional, this, the, the full integral, by, by doing two steps. One is to draw a sample of n points from the distribution described by g. So that's why I was saying g should be a proper uh, probability density, so something normalized. So we would have, um, uh, we draw samples from g, and then um, we're, ordinarily, if, you had, if we were just thinking about computing the mean, we would uh, take 1 over n times the sum of, uh, times the sum of this object that we're interested in, h. But because we've actually drawn from g instead of pi, our true target distribution, we need to add this corrective term, which is the ratio of pi divided by g. So it's a ratio of probability densities. Um, and so this would be our important sampling algorithm. I want to estimate the mean of h with respect to pi. I don't know well how to sample from pi, but I do know well how to sample from g. So I'll go and get a bunch of x's drawn from g. And then instead of just taking the arithmetic mean of h, um, evalu or h evaluated each of the x's I drew, I'll take the arithmetic mean of h multiplied by this corrective factor, which is the ratio of densities. Um, and so it works out that it, this algorithm will give us in expectation, essentially, the thing that we were trying to estimate. So uh, to see that, we can just basically cancel these. Um, it gives us this thing we're trying to estimate, which is the posterior functional. Um, however, it's a noisy estimate, because we're drawing randomly these x's. So you know, like if you're trying to estimate the mean from a sample, it's a, it's a, it has some inherent noise to the estimate. And uh, the nature or the, the, the size of that variance is determined by, uh, by this integral here, which is, um, it looks like this, basically. Of course, it has the square of the quantity we're trying to estimate in there because uh, um, uh, it's you know this is the natural variance formula. It contains the um, it's an integral with respect to the true distribution, and it's modulated by this scaling factor, which is the ratio of the densities. So what that means is that um, if we would choose, I slightly miswrote that here, but if the proposal uh, distribution that we chose was too narrow, so it had um, uh, tails which were less broad than the tails of our, um, of our target functional we're trying to, we're trying to estimate, uh, or we're trying to use to estimate um, as the governing density for our, for our target functional. If, uh, in other words, if g goes to zero uh, at infinity, or so more quickly than does pi, then this variance can become infinite if the domain of x is, is, uh, you know, is itself also infinite. So the idea is that what we want, if we're making an important sampling proposal, uh, is to choose something which is itself uh, broader in terms of its tail behavior than the, um, the target we're looking at. So Brendan mentioned that we um, will often use uh, like a t distribution in, in some kind of MCMC algorithms. Uh, and this would be one case where uh, having something like a t is going to help you guard against, um, uh, against bad behavior of the algorithm, because you deliberately choose for yourself as your proposal distribution uh, something which is inherently broad and probably much broader than any kind of posterior that you're trying to deal with. Um, so I said it was unbiased, but that is really only for the case that this target density has a known normalization. Uh, if you don't know the normalization, so in the case well, that should be normalized. In the case that we're actually interested in, uh, which is the posterior, we usually won't know the normalization. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we just simply have to divide off an additional term uh, 
uh, which is basically the normalization of the weights. So we, um, uh, we have this original term, which is our importance sampling estimator, and then uh, we correct it for this, um, uh, this if, what is effectively a, a noisy estimator of the, um, of the missing ratio. Unfortunately, this is no longer unbiased. So um, uh, importance sampling, although it still, behave, it, still, it still behaves well in the sense that if we have uh, this bound on the variance, if we have a good importance sampling proposal, then uh, we'll still have a central limit theorem, um, and it will converge towards the truth. We won't be unbiased. So for any small sample of draws, from the, of, or any small number of draws used in an importance sampling estimator, uh, will, will not be sufficient to give us unbiased estimates. But generally speaking, uh, we hope that, they won't be, uh, that the bias won't be large, and at least we can control it by um, increasing the number of draws we have uh, from, the, from the proposal. When we look at importance sampling, uh, you start to see, or you start to imagine what we're doing uh, in terms of this weighting, this weight ratio. Um, and so what, one way to think about importance sampling is that we're making an approximation of our target distribution with a weighted set of particles. These are the Xs. So the particle set that we have is, is you know, it's randomly drawn. And um, what we want to do is make sure that we uh, give it appropriate weights to reflect this difference between uh, the, the posterior which we're trying to draw from, or the target we're trying to draw from, and the distribution we actually drew from. Um, and so that's a, it's a density ratio. It might seem at first that it's unfamiliar to use weighted samples to represent a probability density. Uh, I mean, of course, like an actual probability density, an actual posterior, we imagine that it's like the density is something smooth and continuous. Uh, uh, it's, it's nicely um, you know, defined everywhere. And what we have done is we have replaced this smooth density representation with just these uh, you know, weighted discrete points. Um, so it seems like that's a bit weird. But in fact, that's just very much what we're already doing with MCMC. So if you have samples of the posterior from an MCMC code, uh, you could make kind of like a histogram of infinitely thin bins, and you would find usually that um, uh, because MCMC uh, accepts and, re and or sometimes accepts but doesn't always, you, you know, when you reject, you basically repeat, uh, staying at the same value or to begin with, you would find that um, your MCMC approximation of the posterior is also a weighted set of points uh, where the weighting function um, effectively is is a is some constant which has integer multiples where uh, the MCMC chain has not moved, where it's uh, rejected proposals. Um, it's kind of cool to use uh, either MCMC outputs or SMC, or sorry, um, importance sampling approximations of the posterior uh, for, for people like ourselves who uh, just want to get quickly results um, or to look at a range of different results because unlike densities, which require that Jacobian transformation to deal with, and if, you know, if we want to transform the density of x to look at like what is the density function of x squared, we have to go through this uh, ugly process of um, uh, making the density transformation and including the Jacobian. But if we would want to just look at x squared here, um, we can simply apply that operation to each individual point uh, and plot the histogram of x squared. And it's, um, it's, like, it's just completely natural and trivial. Likewise, when um, Brendan mentioned the process of marginalization uh, for, for um, like marginalizing, if you have a two-dimensional posterior and you uh, have taken MCMC or important samples uh, you know, from this posterior, these are two this is a distribution in two dimensions. Uh, in order to marginalize, uh, marginalize them, you just simply ignore the second dimension and plot like the histogram uh, in a single dimension. So, uh, it, you know, working with particles is just way easier, way more natural than working with densities. Um, in fact, uh, yeah. So, one way to think of MCMC codes and uh, important sampling or other different procedures is to think of them as, um, as just tools for generating these weighted particle approximations, uh, whether the weights are uh, you know, more simple as an MCMC or slightly more complicated as an important sampling. Uh, 
Um, so I mentioned that importance sampling has this uh, difficult thing that uh, you, know, you want to make sure your proposal distribution has a well-behaved tail behavior compared to your target. Um, but occasionally, like, you might say, I've got actually a really good distribution or really good proposal G, which I think is like a great approximation to my, to my target, to my posterior. And I don't really want to faff around with trying to um, like, choose something close to G, which has also fatter tails to guarantee against or to defend against uh, you know, a very, very noisy estimator. Um, so this one kind of trick people do is this thing called defensive importance sampling, which would be to say, instead of just using G, which we fear might be too shallow, uh, we can take a mixture of G and some very broad distribution, uh, which we know uh, to have this, the same kind of, or at least, tail behavior, which is, um, which is fatter or sort of broader than the posterior. One way to guarantee that in, um, in the Bayesian context for if we, re we really are trying to important sample the posterior, uh, we can make this a mixture of, where Q is just the prior, because unless uh, we're incredibly unlucky, then the posterior should be more concentrated than the prior. So it's sort of a, it's a little trick to guard against, uh, um, against important sampling estimators without a central limit theorem. So once you have these, this idea of important sampling, then, uh, then people have taken this and thought, well, there must be a lot of other things that we could do which would gradually improve the way that we're applying that and create like better and better estimators. So one natural thing to do is to look at this type of algorithm called adaptive importance sampling. Um, the idea would be that if our importance sampling proposal distribution, our G, is some kind of parametric distribution, which it usually will be because it's natural, or it's straightforward to sample from this, uh, then why not like gradually adjust the parameters of our proposal distribution uh, such that our proposals are closer to the target or posterior that we're trying to estimate. So in this sort of simplistic example, where I imagine only one parameter, which we're going to vary in the proposal, we can make it the, no the mean of the normal proposal with a fixed variance. We might do a two-step procedure like this. In the first step, we just assume uh, the mean, or we just choose for the mean of our proposal density zero, um, because we don't really know where the mode of this posterior is. And we then get like a, norm, a noisy estimate of um, via important sampling of what the posterior looks like. That was step one. Step two is say, to say, well, let's use the sample mean or the, the weighted, I should say, importance weighted mean of these, of, sorry, of these points from our initial approximation, which is quite noisy, to, to improve our choice of importance sampling proposal distribution. Uh, and we, make, we call this one G2. And so for the second step, we'll place our important sampling proposal here, and it's a much better fit to what the posterior looks like. And uh, so we get, uh, we get more samples with a decent weight. And so you can imagine uh, this being an iterative process in which like, we would not just have to, say, uh, vary the mean. We could also say, well, let's improve on the variance. And so you start out with something very broad and a bit off-centered, and then step after step, you move in to have a proposal which eventually should hopefully be a, a reasonable approximation of the target that you're trying to, to um, represent. So it's possible to go even one step more complicated in this type of approach, uh, which, which leads into a class of very powerful algorithms uh, called sequential Monte Carlo algorithms. So the sequential Monte Carlo methods extend the ideas of one representing, or A, representing a target density with a collection of weighted particles. So um, this is basically like from importance sampling. Uh, using our current particles to build a better proposal density um, uh, to, use, to solve difficult inference problems. So it's just taking both ideas from the importance sampling and from the adaptive importance sampling, uh, saying we want to do those, but let's, let's use those in a way which um, uh, which solves some of the more difficult aspects of, of, um, of choosing a good important sampling proposal. And so the way, well, the way to do this is to um, think about a sequence of targets which will, um, which will attempt to, Im to um, uh, important sample from. So in the, first, in, the, in the sort of initial adaptive case, we don't have a sequence of targets. The target 
isn't changing. We're always just trying to, um, uh, you know, to, to find an estimate or some samples from this distribution pi, which is the same everywhere. And so initially we did well in uh, like, you know, we were able to find a crude approximation of pi because um, we had a, um, an important sampling proposal which wasn't terrible to begin with. But in more complicated problems, uh, it's very difficult. Like if you give me a 20-dimensional posterior, uh, it's very unlikely that, that I will be able to guess a good proposal density that would naturally produce even one decent sample from the posterior. So we don't try to sample the posterior straight away. We say, OK, that's too hard. Um, instead, we work with a sequence of targets, uh, something which, which connects a distribution we can sample from and we can approximate well because we know a lot about it to one that we can't, such as the posterior. So one example uh, is this. It would be what's called tempering the likelihood. So we can imagine a class of distributions which connect the prior to the posterior formed like this. Um, it's basically you take the prior, multiply it by the likelihood but you make it the likelihood raised to the power t, where t is some index between 0 and 1. So if t was 0, then this is just 1 everywhere. And all we're saying is that we're sampling from the prior. As t increases towards 1, we get something which uh, moves from the prior towards the posterior, with the posterior being exactly what we get if we set t equal to 1. So this is the sense of defining a sequence of targets. The sequence might look something like this, uh, you know, usually with a prior, or sorry, something very close to the prior, like a t equals 0.05, will be relatively broad uh, compared to our posterior. But as we add, as we increase t, it's like we're using more of the information provided by the likelihood. So the distribution tends to, to become more concentrated. Um, the effect of concentration is very small in this sort of silly one-dimensional illustration, but if you would imagine this to be um, like a high dimensional problem, uh, the volume of, of parameter space occupied by the, you know, most of the posterior mass is going to be much smaller than the amount of space that was allowed by the original prior. So um, uh, this is why uh, we like to make such a sequence. It's not the only sequence we could make, um, and so that, that particular sequence was um, called like the thermodynamic sequence or sometimes the geometric path. There are lots of other options you could do. One of them would be by tempering on the data. So we make a sequence um, indexed by an i, where we say our sequence of densities are going to be the prior times the likelihood formed by, adding, by going from the zeroth, as in not having any data, to the ith data point. So adding gradually uh, data to our model so that it sees more and more of the available data. Um, and again, we should have another sequence which moves from the prior when i equals 0, say we've not given it any data, to the posterior when i equals, say, n, our total sample size. Um, Hi, Ewan. Yeah. Um, I'll try not to troll too, too yeah. much. Um, when I, so I didn't get to, to nested sampling on Tuesday, but I just thought I'd mention at this point that you can sort of think of nested sampling as another variation on this kind of theme yep. with a different sequence of distributions. So if you That's know something one. about nested sampling or if you want mm -hmm. to know something about nested sampling and you understand this or the other way around, um, you can kind of connect them. Yep. They're quite similar. That's not trolling at all. That's helpful. Uh, <laughs> My trolling would be um, <laughs> Skilling 2006 says never use these tempered distributions uh, unless you know that the shape of your likelihood function is not going to be one where something messy happens in the middle of the, the process. Um, so, so could, yeah. So I would say that there's sort of two aspects to consider. In this case, with tempering, uh, we don't necessarily uh, even enter the realm of Skilling's objection because we're not computing marginal likelihoods. We're just evolving as, yeah, exactly, getting to the posterior. Uh, the case where computing marginal likelihoods I've sort of left out, um, although it's worth saying that sequential Monte Carlo gives you a way to also in compute marginal likelihoods, which, um, uh, as Brendan points out, may or may not work, depending in particular if the data, if, the, if in changing the temperature, 
the, there is a sort of very sudden phase change in the shape of the posterior. But um, uh, yeah, but no, what you said about the um, a nested sampling and making a sequence also is, uh, is completely true. So another sequence you could make would be um, a sequence of increasing likelihoods, um, where you start off by not constraining the posterior at all, and then gradually constraining on uh, for the likelihood to be above a certain value. I mean, if you're familiar with nested sampling, that might uh, be a natural way to think about the sequences. Can I ask you something before you yep. move on? Um, the, in the earlier part of the day, when you're lecturing, it seemed like the purpose was to test the validity of our models. That means like you're trying to test your prior. Yeah. And you're finding techniques to do that. Yeah. Now, in, in this case, um, I mean, I can see a quick application where you are observing a process and you're acquiring data. Mm. And so you're getting you know, one data and then a second measurement mm. and then a third and mm. whatever. And then you keep refining your process and getting closer and closer to you know, a good estimate of the posterior. Mm -hmm. But this implies that your prior is nicely defined, mm. that you, you, know, you know what it is. So we're in a completely different situation than we were um, of, compared to what we were talking about this morning, or are we not? No, um, we're in definitely in the same situation. Uh, you, you definitely have to have a proper prior um, to, you know, to perform uh, a sensible and sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, the, the part from the morning is rather um, like how to choose a good prior um, before we've seen some data or before we've, we've even sort of explored the model. Um, this would be, this is rather like the part which was abstracted from the first section of the morning, which is how to fit the model. Um, so I said uh, at the beginning of the day that like most of the time when you're working with a complicated hierarchical model, there's already some kind of software which you'll be using to, that takes the sampling and does it for you, like whether that's Inla or Stan or, or whatever. Um, in this case, if we were actually implementing SMC, we'd be, you know, we'd be ourselves writing our own, our own package for um, for doing sampling, so we would, if we had wrote, written our own SMC sampler, we would want to do one of the things I mentioned at the start of the day, which is those um, uh, testing the uh, the well behavedness of the sampler via the the um, PIT test applied to draws. So you draw from the prior, draw a mock data set, run the samplers, and then uh, see how much of the tail probability is located uh, below the true parameter value to get one of those nice uniform plots to verify the sampler is working. Um, but the reason I'm sort of explaining it at this level of detail is because, um, again, it's very unlikely you will write your own sequential Monte Carlo sampler, but uh, there are a lot of very good packages available which implement these types of models or these types of samplers, so it's good to be aware of like, how do they work um, so that you can, one, choose between whether you want to do a, um, a STAN a H HMC or you want to to use uh, one of the packages that does sequential Monte Carlo. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, I guess that's the motivation and, and the distinction from the morning. Um, oh, so yeah, just one thing about situations in which uh, the tempering of the data, so introducing a sequence based on the data, makes perhaps more sense than the thermodynamic path is in the case where the data has, is not just like independently distributed, it has some kind of natural ordering. So the ordering for say like a financial time series data set uh, is ordered by you know, physical time, by date. So uh, one type of SMC sampler would be to um, uh, structure your sequence of data from the of, as ordered as data from the beginning to, to, to uh, data from the end of your temporal window. So the SMC algorithms, they're one step beyond importance sampling and adaptive importance sampling uh, because they're moving the particles uh, from your original prior density towards the posterior along the sequence. So there's a series of steps. Um, basically, at each step, uh, so imagine we start at the prior. At each step, the, um, our current set of particles represent an approximation to the previous density we were working with. So, uh, you know, so we can sample from the prior, and now we're going to try to uh, make a sample from like the prior times the likelihood to the power of 0.001. Uh, well, what are we going to do? We're going to use our particles uh, 
uh, which, have, which are some weighted uh, approximation of, of our previous target. Um, we could just uh, change the, the index, our sequence, so raise the, raise the likelihood to, some, to the ne next power, and uh, we could recalculate the weights in our particles and just, just keep doing that without moving the particles at all. If we did that, it's very unlikely that we'll end up with a good approximation to the posterior, because to do so, would have, we would have had to have drawn initially particles which lie very close to where the posterior lives, and so it's very unlikely. So as we move along, we are going to want to be, um, uh, to be changing uh, our particle set to be evolving it in some way. Uh, one way that people like to do this is after you calculate the next set of weights, so we have this, we've re-weighted the particles according to the, um, uh, uh, our next target in the temperature sequence or in the data sequence, we, uh, they all take slightly different weights. We then go and resample them. So what that means is to uh, sample with replacement from the current particle set uh, with a probability of drawing any particle which is proportional to its current weight, or its current weight normalized by the sum of all weights. What this means is that if we just do resampling, we're going to end up with multiple copies of some of the particles, those which had the highest weights. Um, we draw according to that probability, we'll get more of those. Uh, and some particles which we had, which had lower weights, will, will be lost from the sample. So now it's like a bit nicer because we have all equal weights, but it's less nice because our effective sample size has gone down because we have so many uh, sort of non-independent uh, particles or just copies of the others. So um, that's not perfect. We need to do one additional step, which is this so-called refreshment step, um, which is to in some way, like jitter these particles around such that they um, are now a um, less degenerate approximation to the current target. So the way that you do that um, is needs to preserve the, the thing that we're trying to approximate. So there's a, like a lot of different ways that you could do the resampling, uh, sorry, the refreshment, I should say. Um, one of them is simply to uh, try to, to move those current particles that you have according to an MCMC algorithm, which like, run for a finite or fixed number of steps and, uh, and therefore um, just update each particle using this weighting ratio. So uh, it seems kind of weird, like you're running an MCMC within an SMC algorithm, um, but it's um, not necessarily, well, it's, I suppose, not necessarily any weirder than simply trying to run an MCMC algorithm over the posterior. One interesting aspect of it, though, that I think would be kind of counterintuitive is that because we start with a draw, which, which is a representation of the previous target, and then we, we weight it appropriately, and now we have a weighted approximation of our current target, um, and, we're, and then we resample that to get um, uh, a bunch of independent copies, sorry, a bunch of uh, degenerate copies these copies, uh, this particle set with the copies and its uniform weight is an approximation, um, an unbiased approximation to the, um, uh, sorry, to our current target. So we don't have to run our MCMC refreshment algorithm uh, for any kind of burn-in period in order to, uh, to stop. What we can do is just run it for a small number of steps um, and we won't, we won't be running into this problem of, of requiring a burn-in. Um, it seems like a strange observation, but uh, it's, it's kind of key to making these algorithms effective. Like if we had to run a very, very long MCMC chain at each, at each sequence, then that would become really inefficient. Uh, but there's plenty of other ways you could think to try refreshing the particles. Um, one of them would be, say, to run an, an additional adaptive importance sampling approach uh, to try to sample a new sequence of particles, or a new set of particles, I should say. Um, and uh, yet another option can occur in the case that we have data that has a natural order ordering. So just like the financial time series, um, if, if we have data in which the, um, uh, the parameters, uh, or sorry, the data themselves have, have a natural ordering, and therefore probably the latent variables of our model have a natural ordering, say in time or space, then um, it can often make sense to sample, uh, to sample our refreshment kernel according to some kind of system dynamics which, which, uh, which our model specifies for the expected behavior uh, by which those particles, uh, 
by the expected behavior of the system given our current state. So these algorithms come up a lot in um, machine learning applications related to things like motion tracking. And in this context, they're also called particle filtering algorithms. So the idea like, behind this one would be if um, uh, we, we know that if we knew the location of where this guy was at time j, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, time i, then at time i plus 1, our model for his movement is just some kind of normal uh, like random walk. In this case, if we have particles j, which represent our approximation to where this guy is, in order to make a good proposal for um, uh, figuring out where he might be next, we can just uh, sample according to the system dynamics, so just move the particles randomly according to where he would move if he was indeed one of those particles. Um, so this is applied in astronomy. Um, you may well have had data which involved an SMC uh, live uh, sort of update code. One of those is for, um, uh, for adaptive optics systems. So in adaptive optics, you have one of these uh, incredibly flexible mirrors, um, which is able to um, uh, be modulated uh, in some way to correct for, for distortion. The way that they guess where to go next um, uh, like what should be the next choice of, of deformation is by using a particle-based approximation, so, or at least by using a, a particle filtering model with the structure. Um, so what you would do is you have a, um, a bunch of drawers which represent your estimate of the wavefront, and then uh, you evolve them according to a simple model for how wavefronts tend to evolve at, at the next time step, and you choose perhaps as your uh, as your choice of mirror uh, deformation, some measure like the mean uh, of all of those particles, or possibly a, uh, you know, a, another kind of summary statistic. And the point is that um, it's a live update procedure where you have your particle set or your particle approximation, you observe new data on, the, um, on, the, on what the wave wavefront looks like at time t, and then you propagate your particles forward make an estimate for what the mirror should look like at time t plus 1, and then take more data, and so that you're constantly evolving the system. And in principle, or in, in practice, I should say, uh, it happens at incredibly high speed in order to, um, uh, to keep up uh, with the blurring of the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, I thought what would be worthwhile is if we try the sequential importance sampling exercise I made, um, and then uh, if we like later, I can discuss the ABC part, or we'll see uh, how people are going with the exercises. Um, so I'll skip ahead to this one. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I assume the uh, the kind of situations where these algorithms would work well are similar to situations where you'd use nested sampling, where if you have complicated multimodal posteriors, you know, mm. moving down from the prior down to the posterior, um, it really helps mm. you there. So does it suffer from the same dimensionality issues as well as nested sampling? I mean, I'd imagine, you know, given you have a finite number of particles in a possibly very high dimensional mm. prior volume. Um, so it, it, basically my question is, are there situations you'd rather use one of these algorithms than nested sampling? You know, are there advantages? Yeah, so I, I'd say techni the technical answer for what is the, um, what is the scaling or the, the behavior of the particle filtering algorithm, for example, uh, as a function of dimension is it should be actually in dimension invariant. The, Problem is, in reality, obviously, it's not. Nothing is. Uh, the difficulties come in with the refreshment kernel, so finding a good way to keep your particles um, uh, non-degenerate, which relies on a decent proposal. Um, if your method of doing an MCMC-based uh, kind of proposal is like a random walk, then you have, then you, then you will do okay. But you know, um, as the uh, as the posterior becomes quite, as the posterior, if the posterior is high dimensional and it has cur unusual curvature, then random walk is itself not a great algorithm. So you can internally um, sample, we say, a Hamiltonian 
dynamics inside, um, and you do quite well. As the key, I think you did identify the important factors as far as where you would like to, Im to apply these models, and that's for cases where the posterior is multimodal. Um, so if you're using like Hamiltonian sampling in STAN, uh, it is sort of no a known thing that if you have a very multimodal posterior, so like uh, two modes separated by a, a valley of very low likelihood, that mixing between those two modes is not efficient. Um, and so the nice thing about the SMC approach or nested sampling is that you should find that because your particles, you have particles started off everywhere, that those near each local mode hopefully coalesce down towards that local mode. Um, yeah, I can think of various pathologies where, um, you know, where it can struggle, but uh, that would be a good use case is for multimodal. Uh, I don't know if Brendan wants to say something. So as a lifelong member of the nested sampling party or religion, uh, I, I have a, an answer for what I think is the, the, the one really strong case for where sequential Monte Carlo is, is really the go, which is in this online situation. So data is coming in over time and you, know, might, you might get like a new data point every day and every time you get a new data point you don't want to go back to the beginning of time and reanalyze your whole data set. You just want to slightly correct what you had yesterday. And in that situation, this uh, sequential importance sampling is like has a major advantage over anything else. Yep. And so that precise uh, scenario is the one which I chose for this example. I mean, that's the the place to look at the algorithm. So this exercise, uh, we imagine our aim is to track some kind of randomly moving object uh, against a crowded field. So the object itself, we imagine, uh, it lives in a two-dimensional space. In fact, we're going to look at it, because it's an astronomical setting, uh, as if it moves on the celestial sphere or on the unit sphere. So its two dimensions are going to be uh, a theta and phi, representing like a right ascension and declination. Uh, it's going to have a, it's going to evolve with this um, uh, type of leapfrog step, where um, its next position will be its current position plus its velocity plus half its acceleration. And I think, uh, oh yeah, that's right, because of the delta here, plus half its acceleration. Uh, its velocity will be updated as its velocity plus its acceleration. And its acceleration at, a, if, at any given time will be drawn from a, um, uh, from a normal distribution uh, independently in each direction. So that's how it's going to move it, um, in the script, which is the one called particle.r, I think. Uh, you'll, you, you, one of the first things you'll do is just to run the code to make a little illustration of how the particle moves randomly, or what it looks like, its motion looks like. Unfortunately, when our life isn't going to be easy, we're not going to be able to observe the particle directly. We're going to have two sources of noise. Uh, one of them will be in the position of the particle, we won't, won't be able to observe either its right ascension or its declination uh, accurately. We're going to get noisy versions of those. I gave them some slightly artificial distributions, but uh, if the, if you can explore these a little yourself. But what the effect of these is doing is just to say that instead of look, seeing the particle where it is, we'll see a, a version of the particle which is drawn from sort of a bit of an ellipse around the particle. So it'll be noisy. Um, we also have another problem, which is that there'll be a lot of, like, say, radar noise, we might imagine, which manifests as a bunch of other possible sources uh, shown on our, on, our sort of, on our screen or whatever our data set is that we're looking at, or, or data device. So um, we won't know precisely uh, which is our particle that we're tracking and which is a noise draw. So um, what the algorithm is going to try to do is say, We've got this current approximation of particles of where we think the particle is. We'll evolve those particles by the system equation to be like, where would we expect to see them one time step from now? And then we'll reweight those particles according to uh, the, the proximity of each particle to uh, some kind of observed source. And hopefully, you, what you'll see is that um, uh, in going through this, the, uh, the algorithm which I've applied, that um, as you run it, the particles do really uh, tend to track the, um, the true source, 
Occasionally, you know, some of them will get dragged off and, and start to think that noise sources are the true source. But then over time, those ones which are, uh, which are following you know, possible sources which look most like the system equations should ultimately be weighted the most favorably and, and the algorithm will lock back on to the source. Uh, so it's much like the Inler exercise, but hopefully with fewer packages that have trouble to be installed. And um, uh, there is occasionally a warning thrown up by the circular package, but it's uh, an ignorable warning. Um, so yeah, I would say for people who managed to succeed in the Inler exercise, definitely start here. If you couldn't get Inler installed, uh, it's up to you whether you want, like we can try to get people to help you uh, get it resurrected and running, and you can do that exercise, or, um, or come on to this one as well and uh, try to install in the later. But I'll, um, and the other, me and the other tutors will be going around uh, you know, to help people and, and answer any questions. Just uh, one last thing. For, for me to fix the problem uh, running it, the only thing I had to do was uh, do conda uninstall r essentials, and then install r from the r page, and then just open r on the command line and paste the install packages, and that was perfect. So maybe that's just, just the problem you have. All right, I'll just say um, before we wrap up for the day, um, uh, 10 minutes of things about this uh, proximate Bayesian computation algorithm, which I've mentioned earlier in the day. The, um, uh, so the idea of approximate Bayesian computation, or ABC, is for a case that um, seems to come up quite a lot in astronomical problems, where we have a model um, which we'd like to fit to the data, but we don't really know how to write down the likelihood function uh, for that actual model that we have. Um, but in, if we're able to write a simulation code, well, this is usually be the form that our model takes, which makes mock data sets, then we can use ABC to um, approximate the posterior by comparing mock data sets generated from the model to the actual observed data set that we had. So one example in, that comes up in my work is for um, transmission of malaria. It's a really complicated uh, sort of system or, or model that we would have. And uh, people make these codes, like they're, uh, div they're sort of divorced from the people who do the statistical modeling. These are like uh, computer coding experts and epidemiologists. They build a huge model. And for this model, you have some free parameters. If you specify those, then you can do things like um, evolve a mock population of humans, mosquitoes, and parasites in order to see what happens and, and how, um, how the village would look at a given time point. So they develop these codes, uh, and they, they can make, uh, follow the mock populations, simulated populations. But then they want some way to calibrate those codes and choose the right parameters to use uh, in comparison against some observed data set. Um, an example in astronomy, there's a good application um, of an ABC-like method, or a problem which we could use ABC on, uh, by Vinay Kashyap in AppJ. This is for the case of X-ray flare data. So we have these really messy observations, which are a mix of genuine X-ray signals, uh, like fl random flaring signals, plus um, some kind of random background noise, all of which is modulated by horrific uh, instrumental systematics. So to write down a good model for what the likelihood looks like, uh, it becomes a real nightmare. Um, and instead, what they would like to do is, um, is to calibrate a model for the X-ray flares in which you um, put in some parameters for the flare and then generate mock data as if it was pushed through the instrumental pipeline. And so you want to use this pipeline model, which you have in trust and you can generate mock data from, uh, as if it were in place of the likelihood. So this is also from Vigne's paper. It's, uh, this is what the actual data for one of their sources looks like. And this is what mock data sets look like, um, generated randomly, uh, while one of the parameters of the model, alpha, is increased from 1.8 to 3. And so just looking at it visually, you can see that these ones seem to be way too low. They're not quite right. But that these higher value parameters of alpha uh, look better. And so you can do that comparison visually, um, but obviously, uh, if, you have, um, if you have more parameter space to explore, uh, you're not going to want to sit around making uh, plots to keep looking at, comparing one after other, and doing some kind of manual search through the parameter space. So instead, we use this ABC method, which can uh, slot into sequential Monte Carlo or into MCMC sampling algorithms. 
The ABC posterior looks like this. Um, it, looks, it starts with the prior, so like uh, any Bayesian model, it has a prior on the parameters. Um, it then says, uh, for any given value of, um, of the parameter which we, which we draw, we're going to approximate the likelihood um, as the proportion of draws from the sampling distribution which are, which are closer than a certain tolerance to the actual observed data. So um, this can be read as, a, um, as an algorithm called rejection ABC. The algorithm would look like this. We choose a theta from the prior. We generate some mock data under those parameters. So we call those Y. How can we generate that mock data? Well, we have a likelihood function, which describes a sampling distribution. It's a generative model. So we can do that. We can make that mock data. We then take some kind of summary of the mock data. This summary operation is used because, uh, for example, like in this uh, uh, Vignes data, there's, you know, the actual data set itself is, uh, you know, consists of maybe like 100 different uh, x-ray intensities. So it's like a 100-dimensional object. And uh, we don't, and, but the actual information that's contained in it is, um, which you, your eye picks up, is something less than 100-dimensional. It's like what we're really interested in, in capturing is not whether the model uh, picks up uh, that, that um, this is exactly a peak and, and so forth. It's more we're interested in capturing the behavior um, in some, in some uh, lower information sense of the actual data. So we make a summary of the data. And so we do that. We compute the summary of the mock data and a summary of the observed data. We, inserted, we compute a distance between the two. And then for a given tolerance, we decide uh, if the mock data summary has ended up as sufficiently close to our true data, then we'll accept that theta. Otherwise, we'll chuck it away, and we'll go back to our prior, uh, draw another theta, draw another mock data set, and, and keep repeating, say, until we have like 100 draws from this approximate posterior. Uh, it's hard to do this if we're just drawing from the prior. So, um, this, for this reason, uh, what we're going to do is have an SMC ABC approach. Uh, what is the sequence here for the SMC part? The sequence would be a sequence of decreasing tolerances. So um, we start by accepting uh, any mock data sets which look vaguely like the observed data, like they're actually pretty terrible representations of it, but you know, they help us uh, learn a little bit about what the posterior looks like. Then we say, OK, we're going to be stricter and, and only accept data sets which are a bit closer and uh, so on, and we can keep doing this until uh, we lose patience or, or we run out of computational time. And hopefully, we've, we've um, managed to reduce this tolerance uh, quite close so that the mock data sets of, that we've um, accepted have actually been reasonable approximations to the data that we observed. A note of caution is that the ABC posterior will almost never be identical to the true posterior, because um, basically, uh, well, basically, what we're doing is we're accepting, instead of just uh, saying uh, data which is exactly the same as the observed data, we're accepting data which is close to the observed data. So we're giving up some information. We're also giving up some information by using those summary statistics, which are lower dimensional, uh, rather than using the full, full data set as the basis of our comparison. So it's, it's never going to be that the ABC posterior, but well, it's very unlikely that the ABC posterior will exactly be equivalent to the posterior you would have got if you knew the likelihood. If you knew the likelihood, you almost certainly shouldn't do ABC. It's a crazy idea. It's only good where you have this model which was so difficult that you couldn't do the likelihood, um, and so instead you, you have this uh, simulation-based model. Question. Yep. Sorry. Um, just go back two slides. Uh, sorry, one more. Uh, uh, sorry, forwards. One, two. Yeah, yep. stop. Um, so is epsilon here presumably in practice driven by some understanding of the noise model, even if you don't explicitly have one? Uh, or I mean, you know, you've got to give it at least an order of magnitude, right? So you, there must, you know, I understand that there's no uh, explicit or no accurate explicit measurement uh -huh. stroke noise model, but you must have some feeling for this in order to get in the right ballpark here. Yeah. It's, I would say that the choice of epsilon is not, um, uh, hmm. Did you say that question one more time? Yeah, so, so, yeah, 
So in order to yeah. in order to compare, in order to decide whether or not the you know how, how yeah. close to a data uh, a yeah. simulated data set is with a measured data mm -hmm. set, you have to have some feeling of what close means. Yep, that's right. And uh, generally, that that closeness is not it's not the epsilon itself. Like um, uh, you could just say draw like 50 data 50 mock data sets under parameters from the prior and take like a histogram of what the epsilons look like and you could just choose to start from like the smallest epsilon that you actually observed could be a, maybe a starting point it's sort of that's not that's like not the 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 trick the trick is um is in your representation of what it means to be similar like what the distance or the summary statistic is so yeah, the, the yeah. art of abc is really to um, decide what features of the data you want to be similar and what features aren't. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I would say that's, uh, that's the key. Um, so it has been used in uh, astronomy a few times. Um, uh, importantly, there's been some libraries and packages which allow you to uh, relatively straightforward implement the, the SMC ABC algorithm. Um, and applications have got increasingly sophisticated so in this uh, particular example, they um, were trying to constrain the lensing, uh, like the le like a lensing model for what this, uh, what this, um, uh, what the foreground, the lensing galaxy looks like, um, by making by generating mock data images, um, which they compare to the observed data. I think I maybe didn't quite give that in the right physical uh, description, but. Uh, but certainly the process looks very impressive as far as what they're doing is they're making a comparison of, they have a generative model for generating mock images, like mock lens images, which they think they, they could look like under different model parameters, and they run ABC to um, compare those to what they actually observed for this cluster in their weak lensing survey. Um, the very last thing to say on this would be that um, uh, I said ABC naturally fits within the sequential Monte Carlo framework, but you will see in a number of cases, I didn't put the reference here, but there's, um, oh yes, there is this one, Robin et al. Uh, this is also in the astronomy literature. Uh, you'll see some applications where they do MCMC uh, with a, an approximate Bayesian computation step, and it works by inserting, re replacing the regular Metropolis Hastings acceptance probability with this random uh, generation of mock data and you accept if the mock data is within the tolerance, you reject the proposal otherwise, um, and you wait by uh, some kind of proposal density to keep for, the, for the Hastings part of the step. Um, and the way this works is it can be understood within something called the pseudo-marginal approach. I have notes on that uh, the next few slides, um, but probably it's not of, of as general interest, so I'll leave that for later. Um, Brendan, maybe you look like you had a question, or no? Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention the ABC algorithm because it's become, it seems increasingly useful um, and uh, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of a neat way to start thinking about um, generative models and, and likelihoods. So uh, I'll leave it there. Okay, excellent. Please thank uh, you and...